a very special guest with us that's going to be joining us in several different ways. And today he's live in person with me. This is Professor Joe Valencic. And Thanks, Joe, buddy. where are you a professor? I'm a professor at Saddleback College located in Southern California. And it certainly is my pleasure here to be with such distinguished guests. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to what he looks like in real person because next week you're going to see him underwater. But I'm going to pick your brain today. Joe, okay. tell me, what to you is a reef? A reef. A reef is a home, a habitat for millions of animals and plants. It's a diverse community then where these plants and animals interact together. And from the videotape that we'll see, it's a very pretty one. Very pretty. And it depends on where we are as to what it looks like. Now, what do you think? Let's see what these kids know about some of this. Tell me, what do you think is one of the important functions of a reef? Uh, to keep at, like shelter for the animals and like to keep away from their predators if they can't, the predators can't fit in cracks that the small fish can not fit in. Uh, Excellent. Okay. And where do you think they would find shelter? Um, in the holes and stuff. Okay. What might those, the holes, what might the bottom of that reef be made out of? Uh, sand. Sand and what else? Rock. Okay. Rocks and probably coral. Oh, okay. What, what do we have living in this? Reef. Oh, we've got 25% of the species of marine communities that live around the reef. We've got a diversity of virtually everything, Patty, from shrimps to moray eels to various fish to worms to sponges, and we hope to share all of them with the reef science. Okay, kids. Russ, what do you think is probably the biggest challenge of an animal that lives in the reef? Um, of it being, if, if the reef being destroyed by humans are like, if there's too many fish there, fish eat all the food in that one reef, and then they're going to have to move out. Or Great answer. Great answer. And it's something we want to talk about here is what these animals eat in this reef. Now, think, guys, if you were one of these critters that lived in a reef, what might be some things that you might eat? What might be one thing? Uh, algae. Algae. and stuff. Little minnows. Okay, That's little fish. Algae. What else do they eat? Well, there's a lot of small shrimps, little crabs down there. And many of them eat various types of algae that live on the reef. So all those answers were very good. Okay, let's talk about this plants and this algae business. Now, if I'm a fish, I can go find something to eat. But if I'm a plant, what do I eat? And we know that a plant cannot just go to a grocery store, find something to eat. But a plant is what's called a producer and has to create its own food. I want to talk about how this plant produces food for here for a minute. I've got a lovely plant here with us today. Now. She's healthy, she's growing, but what makes her grow? Number one, we know that she needs to have sunshine, okay? Plants also need water. We got sunshine, we got water, she's starting to grow. The plant also needs carbon dioxide. And we've got carbon dioxide just flittering back and forth here. But to make it be a really, really healthy plant, we need some nutrients. And so we have Mr. Nutrient here that is fertilizing this plant. And as you can see, these nutrients probably are coming really from the ground. Now, this plant is going through a process called photosynthesis. And what happens is that it takes all of these things. It takes the water, the nutrients, the carbon dioxide, the sunshine all interact together. And when these interact together, the plant gives off two things. Number one, it gives off oxygen. The plant also is producing its own food in a form of sugar, something that we all eat. What you've seen just here is what we call photosynthesis. It is what plants do to stay alive. Now, Joe, I'm familiar with plants on land, but what happens in the ocean? Our plants, plants obviously have to, the seaweed has to go through this, and what does this? The difference, Patty, is that the plants take their nutrients from the water itself, the phosphates and the nitrates, like just like our little gardener was putting in. But the nutrients then come from the water, the sunlight penetrates through, and the plants, the miniature diatoms, which are only the size of a head of a pin, all to the giant kelp then grow incredibly large in the same process of photosynthesis underwater as we see here on land. You know, one of the tricks, though, that are one of the problems I can see is that this sunlight isn't going to go way down deep underwater. No, not only does it not go that deep underwater, Patty, but the colors are filtered out. 
We lose the red color in the very first few feet than the oranges and the yellows. So our deep plants then have a completely different light spectrum than the normal trees and plants that we have on land. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to come back and explain exactly how that happens as we look closely at both the coral reefs and temperate reefs. Speaking of which, we want to take a little trip here and explore first, take a look at a coral reef. You know, a reef is defined by where it is located and what lives in it. Here in Hawaii, we're surrounded by some coral reefs. Joe, tell us about coral reefs here. This is an incredible diversity to dive in, and you're looking at a reef then that we explored not too long ago. Many people say that coral reef ecosystems are among the most biologically diverse and productive in the entire world. Now, they also serve as indicators of environmental health. Now, these reefs then are often called the rainforest of the ocean because they sustain nearly 25% of all marine species and represent some of the most magnificent living systems in the world. You're looking here at basically a condominium structure. You can see how these coral reefs extend upward. We have various plate-like corals. This we can think of as independent branches or independent floors then, all of which animals and plants live. Here we have soft corals then that flow with the currents, but nonetheless still provide both food and protection for many of the small reef community animals. These reefs then are extremely important because they provide, as I mentioned, not just food, but protection. As we move into deeper water, we can see some anemones moving slowly back and forth and the hundreds and hundreds of different types of fish then maneuvering around. Here we see a Moorish idol against some staghorn coral. And this coral is unique because it can grow up to eight inches per year. Now, if we look back here, we see some of the small butterfly fishes, some of the other damsel fishes moving in to the various areas. Now, these plate corals that you see sometimes are four foot long, absolutely incredible. And underneath them, we find things like this lionfish. And of course, above them, we see fish like these little clownfish that have a very unique symbiotic relationship with many of these anemones. You can see the clownfish moving back and forth. In this case, a tomato clown is immune to the stinging cells in the anemone. So the anemone itself does provide them protection. This is an unusual animal I filmed in a mid-Pacific island known as a basket starfish. Notice it doesn't have any radiating arms. We also see some jellyfish, animals that live directly on top of the reef. And of course, moving at the reef base into the sand, we see this giant sea cucumber. Now moving over the reef base, you'll look at some tiny worms in the front that are called feather duster worms, and also some animals then that live burrowed into the reef called tunicates. My favorite is the octopus, and I've had an opportunity to dive with them, and this octopus you'll see later crawling over my mask and onto my video camera. Here we see a nice friendly moray eel simply looking at its reflection in the front of my camera lens. The mouth movements then are not to be dangerous. Here again, a feather duster worm, and as my gloved hand touches it, notice how it instantly retracts for protection into the reef. Absolutely incredible communities, and you can see the diversity. Here again, we see another starfish, but more importantly, the starfish themselves are used for protection. This, a starfish known as a crown of thorns, has about a hundred tiny small fish inside the thorns end, which actually use the thorns for protection. It's, it's absolutely amazing what we find on the reef. The beauty, the diversity, the color, the fish, it's really a breathtaking environment to dive in and one that we want to share with you on the ReefQuest series. And a temperate reef is in a different area. It's got a different temperature. It's got different animals. It's got kelp forests, things that are very different from the coral reef. Let's take a look at this and compare this to the coral reef. down at the kelp forest on the uh, ocean surface. This is known as a kelp canopy, and you can see how extremely dense this canopy is. It's uh, absolutely incredible, home for a lot of the California seals, the sea lions, and of course the little friendly otters. Now they forage in here for food, but they also use it for protection. And you can see swimming down here, they are truly amazing. While maybe the coral reefs are known as the rainforest of the ocean, these, these I call the sequoias of the sea, because like giant sequoias, they extend up hundreds and hundreds of feet. In fact, 
This giant kelp that you're looking at is really the jack and the beanstalk of the ocean. Under ideal conditions, Patty, this plant can grow up to two feet a day. I mean, isn't that incredible? Two feet in one day. Now, as we look on the bottom, we see a lot of different types of algae, known as brown algae, red algae, all because of the different pigments in their fronds. So they photosynthesize at greatly different depths. This is an amazing area to dive in and explore, both for the animals as well as some of the plants that live in these communities. Now what I'm going to do is take you close up at one of these plants and you'll see, again, some of these little teeny tiny balls on the plant. These balls are air bladders, known as pneumatocysts. They actually help the kelp float because we know there's more sunlight in the near surface waters. By floating to the surface then, they can photosynthesize much better. But these communities, these sequoias of the sea, are indeed great communities to dive in. Fish, as you can imagine, love them, both for the food and the protection. So diving through there, we'll see tremendously large fish, like groupers, and large sea bass, and even in the bottom. Here's our shark that one of our request callers said that she would like to be. And we see them all in through the kelp community. This fish is unusual, known as a kelp fish. Look at its protective coloration. Both its shape and its color blend in almost perfectly. Now, in contrast to the kelp fish, what we can look at now is the state fish of California, known as the Garibaldi. This fish, then, is brilliantly colored orange to warn predators that, hey, this is my territory. Now, we're looking over the reef now, and you can see all of this encrusting algae, some of the large fronds, the blades of kelp, and in the bottom, my friend, Sebastian the Crab. And we'll take a dive with him a little later uh, in one of the Reef Quest series. We also have some unusual fish then that have poisonous spines. This is a scorpion fish. And of course, near there, an urchin and a tube anemone. Brilliant colors moving back and forth with the current. Our sea urchins then abound in many of these temperate reef communities as they do in the tropical reef communities. And of course, one of their close relatives, the sea cucumber, who we'll be talking a lot more of. Starfish, we have a number of different species. And again, these animals live within the protection of the reef. So indeed, this community is an absolutely breathtaking environment, even with plants like this Gargonian soft coral. You know, this kelp forest was an awesome place to me. It was, um, like I said, very similar to what a real forest was. And we are going to come back in a couple weeks and explore it closer. Now, <clears throat> we have a different Uncle Joe we want to enter, a different Joe we want to introduce right now. And at this time, I'm going to refer to him as Uncle Joe, my favorite uncle. And Uncle Joe is going to be coming to us each week from underwater. That's right. Okay. Patty, I'm going to share the experience of scuba diving with everybody out there in the ReefQuest audience. And you might wonder how I'm going to do that. Well, first off, I'll be able to talk to you using this special mask. The mask has a microphone built into it, but the mask then is connected via cable directly into my underwater video system. So here I have a video camera, I have lights that I can control underwater, and I also have a red color correcting filter, and of course this filter then allows me to bring back more color in the water. Now, when I use this camera, it's kind of unique, because what I do is I will turn this camera on myself and actually photograph myself underwater talking. I'll move the camera down to the animal. You can see how they live and work and move around the reef. So it's an let's, interesting let's, idea. And let's take a look at this. And one thing you're going to notice is you're going to hear him breathe as he talks. But let's go to Uncle Joe underwater. from Reef West. This is Uncle Joe, and today we're at Anacapa Island, which is about 15 miles off the coast of California. Now, I'm wearing this special full-face mask with a microphone, so when I breathe, the air rushes from my tank past the microphone and gives a slight hissing sound. So, as I talk to you, I may sound like Darth Vader, but it's only the air rushing by my mask. You don't have to rescue me underwater. At least I hope not anyway. I'm gonna take you diving to show you some of my friends, and some unusual animals that we only find in this temperate water reef structure at Anacap Island. So let's get down and look at the bottom.
the animals that absolutely dominate this environment is seen in front of the camera. This is the giant red spiny urchin that you see. We have many of them in tropical temperate waters around the world. But here, here with minimal predators, these urchins abound. What do they do? They eat the algae. They have little rasping beaks that go in, scrape algae off the rocks, or they eat fronds of kelp. Just like you see, this little frond, a, a giant kelp, it's tucked underneath this urchin. This is what he's having for lunch. I try to tug at that, I'll probably pull it directly out of its mouth. If you're very careful, you can pry one of these urchins off the rock, as I've done it here. Now this, this you can see from the coloration, is why they call it the giant red urchin. And uniquely for scientists, because we name things in Latin terms, the genus species on this has 26 letters. It's the longest scientific name of any marine creature. This is called Strongylus centrotus franciscianus. Now, kind of a big Latin name for an animal then that is not really quite so big after all. It does have a tremendous defense mechanism with the spine. And you can see, as I bring the bottom of the urchin in toward the camera, the little beak, oh, we have a little fish patching in front of us. And this beak then, is what's actually used to pry the algae either off the rocks or to consume the little frogs. Urchins have spiny skins, so technically scientists put them in a phylum called Echina dromata. That means a spiny skinned animal, and of course they're related to starfish. If you like uni, this is where the uni come from, the caviar. And it's used by many nations as a delicacy. So we'll put this urchin back on the reef, down with the many other urchins. So let me slide it in here. You can see how this community is totally dominated by hundreds and hundreds of urchins that live here, wedged in among the rocks at Anacapa Island. Isn't Uncle Joe cool? And you know, I've been sitting here for days waiting for Uncle Joe to come. I saw him once come by me, and I really want Uncle Joe to do a story on me, but he doesn't seem really excited about who I am. And I'm really a cool animal, but I have some problems living out here in the ocean. I'm a hermit crab, and a hermit crab is an animal that was born without a shell. So what I have, as you can see my tail back there, is uncovered, and it's made out of kind of soft, tissue and so when I bump against the rocks and things it hurts. I'm also really vulnerable. Anybody that wants to eat me can come up and just grab me just like that. So I'm looking for a home and you know maybe if I find the right home that Uncle Joe will come do a story on me. I live in dead people's shells. So I'm looking for a a snail shell of some kind to jump into and ooh look at this snail shell that I'm gonna stick my little tail right up inside this shell. And ooh, I look much better now. Maybe Uncle Joe will like me. Now I'm protected. I have a place to live. When I grow out of this shell, I'm gonna just wiggle my way out. I'm gonna go find another one and climb inside. And you know, if I find a shell that I like and somebody else is in it and they're smaller than me, I can just go grab them out of their shell and I can take over their shell. It's not very nice, but it's something that hermit crabs do. Now, I have found a shelter for myself, but I gotta find food. And food is a little difficult. I gotta move around, I gotta crawl, I gotta find things. And I'm not really an energetic person. So I figured out that if I can partner up with somebody, maybe this will make my life easier. And I'm just kind of waiting here, moving around, seeing what else is in the water. And look what is here. It's my favorite friend. This is the Sea anemone Ross. Sea anemones are friends of hermit crabs. They tend to attach themselves to the shell of a hermit crab. Now think about this. Why would this sea anemone want to be attached to me? Number one, I can make that sea anemone move. That sea anemone can't go anywhere. It's stationary to a rock. So when I find one that I like, I again over. I can use my claws. I can just pull that sea anemone off the rock and put it onto my back. Now, 
there's an advantage of this to me. The sea anemone is going to eat things, and it's going to catch things. And as it catches things, it might drop little pieces of food down, and I'm going to be able to then grab those little pieces of food and eat this stuff. It's a very positive friend for me. I think he also kind of camouflages me also. Hermit crabs. Cool things. Uncle Joe, I sure hope you're watching what I'm doing. And Uncle Joe, I'd like to go to you and see if you can answer some questions. And my first question is, Uncle Joe, are you ever going to film me? Oh, absolutely. You're going to be the star of the show. But I have a question for Jim. Now, if, if Patty is a crab, does that mean she's crabby? No, she's no. too nice for that, right? But we do have some great questions on the Internet. One came from Anita in Wayne, Michigan. And Anita, your question was terrific. How come the ocean is so blue? Well, when we dive down, what happens is the water acts like a filter, taking out the reds, the oranges first, and all of a sudden, all we have left is the blue-green. So that's why some of the shots that you've seen, I was in deep water, look blue-green. But when you're on the surface, it looks blue because it reflects from the clouds. It reflects the color from the sky, and we see that nice blue area. Now, we have another great question coming in from, uh, actually, Renee in uh, Kailua, Hawaii, and that is, do they have coral reefs in cold water? Not really. Coral reefs, then, are generally in water temperatures above 78 or so degrees. Cold water does not contain enough calcium carbonate, the reef-building materials. I've had an opportunity to dive a number of times in the Antarctic. That water is 28 degrees, and again, we have no reef-building animals down there. Another great question then that Matt asked from Wayne, uh, Michigan is, will sea, cumbers, sea cucumbers bite? Well, not actually. Sea cucumbers, as Randy mentioned, are detritus feeders. Now that's a big word, but really what it means is that a sea cucumber is a vacuum cleaner. What it does is it sucks in the sand, pulling out what it wants, which is really the dissolved organic nutrients. So indeed, it would not bite, even if you put your finger in or near its mouth. You know, lots of great questions, and I encourage you guys to keep sending them in. Any question that that we don't, any mic, any any question that you have, we will be um, answering via the internet to you. We can't get to all of them here, but we want to show you one more very special thing. Uncle Joe also builds things, and Uncle Joe has built for request a very special camera. Can you quickly tell us about this? Okay, we. On your website, you'll be able to dial in what we call the ReefQuest Coral Cam. And this is a very special camera that is built inside it and allows us then, via this cable, to put pictures directly onto the Internet. So when you dial into the site, we will have this camera located in Shark's Tank, in coral reefs, in various aquariums then throughout Hawaii and hopefully in the Pacific. Now your students will be able to see the images and then also get scientific data, making observations, and even be able to control some of the functions to do their own experiments. So this is the ReefQuest Coral Cam, Patty. Built by Uncle Joe, and it, it's really uh, going to be a fun thing for you guys to play with. Um, hopefully later this afternoon that it will be up and um, going, that I would like you guys to go in, take a look at this. You will find it again on our home page and you will be able to um, get in there, find things in this tank. Now we know that today it is being placed in a shark tank at the Waikiki Aquarium. Now next week we are, not, we are going to have an Uncle Joe segment with a critter, but we're also going to have Uncle Joe live underwater off of um, Honolulu here. And Uncle Joe will be in the water swimming around. He's, we're going to send him out to find things for us. And he's going to talk to us live from underwater. So we'll be able to ask him questions right there during the program. Again, I encourage you guys to keep sending in questions, um, interact with us, and we will get some answers to you.